of sentencing, um, you know, when I uh, was speaking to one of my classmates a number of years back, and I said, I'm teaching a course on sentencing. Uh, and I should preface this by saying he and I graduated from law school in 1988, a million years ago. Uh, I said, I'm teaching a course on sentencing. He said, well, sentencing, what is there to teach? You say, your honor, my client's 36 years old and he's married, he's got two kids, he's a truck driver, and there you go. And that's sentencing. So indeed, when uh, he and I started in the practice of law, part 23 of the criminal code didn't exist. Uh, sentencing was a largely impressionistic matter, and there was uh, relatively little guidance uh, statutorily or by way of the common law. The area has evolved very quickly uh, in the course of my career, and at today's date, I would venture to say that sentencing is one of the most quickly evolving areas of law. Criminal law, as you all know, evolves more quickly than most other areas, and within criminal law, sentencing evolves at what is relatively a lightning pace. Uh, what I would like to do in this short seminar is uh, try to cram into about an hour uh, what I teach over the course of four months in my sentencing course at the University of Alberta Law School. And what I want to do here is try to provide you with a roadmap or a toolbox to approach a sentencing. And uh, the idea here is that there's a step-by-step -step approach that you can apply to any sentencing hearing, uh, and if you follow this, you will arrive at a nuanced and considered and eminently supportable position on sentence. So it starts, of course, like most legal analyses with a consideration of uh, the statutory text. So the first thing you're trying to do is determine the range of sentence applicable to your particular offense. You start always with the statute. So you look at the uh, uh, section that creates the offense and creates the uh, range of sentence. All sentences in the criminal code, as we all know, have a maximum sentence. Some have minimum sentences, but generally the range is quite broad for most offenses. And you then look uh, next to whether there are any statutory aggravating factors that apply. And here you have to look in two places. Firstly, you're going to look at the particular section. Uh, so can we have the next slide? Uh, this is an example of a statutory aggravating factor in the context of fraud. There we go on next slide. There we go. So uh, as you see uh, in 381.1, uh, a fraud prosecuted by indictment, if the value of the subject matter exceeds $1 million, then there is a minimum punishment of two years in jail. Uh, and uh, that is an aggravating factor that is unique to that particular section. So uh, stolen property, a theft of two of a million dollars or more, that doesn't apply. But if it's fraud and it's over a million dollars, then you've got that uh, minimum sentence. Uh, the next slide uh, is section 269.01. So in a different contact, context, in the context of assault, uh, where the victim of the assault is a public transit operator engaged in the performance of his or her duty, uh, the court must consider that to be an aggravating circumstance. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? 270.03. Um, do we get 0 0.03? We have assault on a peace officer. 270.03 is another of these statutory Sorry, aggravating Paul, that was a mistake on my part my apologies okay uh well let me just quickly look that up you'll have to do that the old-fashioned way reading it out oh my goodness not used to that with you uh so 270.03 states that a sentence imposed on a person for an offense under 270 270.01 or 0 0.02 committed against a law enforcement officer as defined shall be served consecutively to any other punishment imposed on the person for an offense arising out of the same event or series of events. So again, something that operates to aggravate the sentence, mandatory uh, consecutive sentence. And we can take down that slide now, thanks. So you're looking first to those statutory sections 
And then secondly, you're going to look to section 718.2, which we looked at a few minutes ago, to see if any of those statutory aggravating factors. Uh, then once you've done that, the next thing, of course, is uh, your research. So you look to common law authority. And I'll say a little bit more about sentencing research later on in this seminar, uh, but you're going to try to discern a range of sentence from the common law authorities. So that's step one of the approach. The second step of the approach is to determine the facts that flowed from the conviction. In the case of a guilty plea, this is usually pretty easy. You've got agreed facts, sometimes reduced to writing as an agreed statement of facts. That is best practice, uh, but often in quick dock at court guilty pleas, it's done orally, but the facts are usually not contentious and easily determined. Uh, a sentencing after trial may be more complex. Uh, the trial judge in giving a decision where a conviction results is focused on the elements of the offense uh, but may not necessarily be focused on the facts which operate to either mitigate or aggravate sentence. So sometimes in a trial context, uh, even after a conviction, uh, there may be a further hearing that's necessary, further evidentiary hearing that may be necessary sometimes to uh, determine facts that are relevant not to guilt or innocence, but to sentence. So the facts, of course, have to be determined. The third step then is to characterize the facts. In the sentencing context, facts are either aggravating or mitigating or neutral. Now, this is a mistake that I commonly see, and, and Peter, from your appellate practice, I'm sure you'd agree that it's a, it's a common mistake to characterize neutral facts as either aggravating or mitigating, or more commonly still, to characterize the absence of an aggravating fact as mitigating. In, and the reverse is true as well. The absence of a mitigating fact is not aggravating. So it's important to carefully characterize those facts. So as an example of that, for example, let's look at remorse. Uh, everyone knows that remorse is where it exists and is present and provable, commonly recognized as a mitigating factor. But I can't tell you how many times I've heard Crown prosecutors say, uh, there is no evidence here of remorse, and therefore that's aggravating. Uh, what do we think about that? Peter, I invite you to weigh in on that. Do you think the absence of remorse is an aggravating factor? So uh, the absence of remorse is not supposed to be an aggravating factor. It's one of those that gets built in in that sort of, well, I'm not using it as an aggravating factor, but I would point out that the accused contested these charges has never said X, Y, or Z. And, you know, you get that back and forth and numerous appeals, of course, going up on that question of whether it's an absence of remorse uh, was a neutral factor or whether it was used to uh, increase. It's just so, it's so hard to do because remorse is a mitigating and the absence of a mitigating is in a sense aggravating because it reverses what you would otherwise find, but that is not the way the case law deals with it. It's certainly, judges can remark on it. Yes, judges can certainly remark on it, but I would suggest, and in fact have argued quite strenuously in, in a number of cases, that the absence of remorse is simply the absence of a mitigating factor. It does not operate to aggravate the sentence beyond what should flow from the other established facts. Uh, similarly, of course, uh, a criminal record that is dated, unrelated, uh, although any criminal record is to some extent an aggravating factor, uh, that can be reduced to almost a neutral factor where the record is neither recent nor related. But it's important to look carefully at the facts and to really think through whether any particular fact is truly aggravating or truly mitigating, or if it's simply a neutral fact that exists. So uh, having looked at the facts of the offense, you know, you now have a framework on the first part of proportionality, that is the seriousness of the offense. And the, uh, the other point I should make in relation to that is uh, arising from uh, at least one recent Supreme Court of Canada decision, uh, which clearly stated that in trying to determine the seriousness of an offense, the maximum sentence is a proxy that was the word the Supreme Court used, a proxy for the seriousness of the offense. And if you think that through a little bit, it's sort of a common sense proposition. An offense that has a maximum sentence of five years is inherently less serious than an offense that has a maximum sentence of 14 years or life. 
So uh, that provides you with some guidance there. But these first three steps are all really intended to uh, provide you with a framework for analyzing that first half of proportionality, which is the seriousness of the offense. So um, I should have said, I guess, at the outset that if anybody wants to pop in with a question or a comment, I certainly welcome that. So having covered that issue, does anyone have questions or comments about anything I've talked about so far? Paul, I'm going to tell you that I'm also um, <clears throat> I'm also uh, putting into the chat box right now that people can feed questions as they arise as well if they don't feel comfortable like speaking out and as we go. So I will, okay. uh, I'm just putting a note to that effect right now. Listen up. If you're a lawyer or studying to become one, you should check out this book. Professor Sankoff's Guide to Persuasive Legal Writing has received rave reviews from lawyers and students who have used it to improve their skills. It's jam-packed with tips and tricks to help you boost your writing, craft memorable intros, advocate without sounding like an advocate, and structure your work to make it more effective before the courts. Take advantage of Professor Sankoff's years of experience in teaching legal writers, mentoring young advocates, and filing factums at courts across Canada. The simple truth? This book will make you a better writer. Period. Get your copy at petersankoff.com.